Hello you, whoever you are. Let's start in Australia this time and their PMI. Manufacturing remains flat in December and that's actually good. The, the report is good. It's flat but it's good. You can see in the chart there on the right that green line turns up. It's, it's a good report. These are the details. Australian PMI up back up into the positive ter territory. It was 47.8 and now it's at 50.2. You can see in the December 2011 column. Production is back up over 50. Employment is increasing. New orders are increasing. Inventories are increasing. Supplier deliveries have increased as well. So you can see the report is really quite good. I've kind of highlighted input prices because they're up a slightly again and if there wasn't going to be a world recession that would be overheating a bit. Selling prices that I've kind of linked to there are up as well but they're below 50 so margins are being um, squeezed in Australia. Average wages are up again quite a lot so if it wasn't going to be a world recession uh, definitely Australia would be overheating again. Capacity utilisation is up and again signs that inflation probably would feed through at those sort of numbers. But that middle one that I've highlighted in yellow exports down 6 from 53.4 to 47.4. That'll probably be China and China's slowdown. And all of these numbers are really not completely dependent on China, but whatever happens in China will be a great mover for what happens here in Australia. As I say so many times. Let's move on to Canada and the headlines does us. RBC Canadian Manufacturing Purchasing Managers Index finds output growth strengthens to eight month high in December. Canada is kicking it good style. They're doing well. The UK manufacturing PMI, manufacturing production stagnates in de December as new orders inflow remains weak. But that's not too bad. It's not disastrous. I've highlighted the first line of the summary. The UK manufacturing sector showed signs of stabilisation at the end of 2011. You can see in those charts the blue line has a little tick up at the end of 2011. Certainly not disastrous for the United Kingdom. And the global PMI. All of these are thrown into one and to make the big global PMI and it edges back into expansion territory in December. So similar picture to the UK but an expanded out macro to the world and um, a little it had just dipped below 50 but it's just gone back over 50 which is going in the right direction and the note there is global manufacturing employment increased for the 25th consecutive month in December with the pace of jobs growth the quickest since July Staffing levels were raised in the United States, Japan, Germany, France, Austria, Canada, Russia, India, Taiwan, Ireland and Turkey. So nothing disastrous in those PMIs. Right, let's get back to MMT and the job guarantee idea. This is Edward Harrison, Credit Write Downs, who's having his say about it and tells us again over the holidays a debate broke out in the blogosphere about the so-called job guarantee idea that the MMT folks have bandied about. I call this controversial idea unemployment insurance for the 21st century, something I first addressed in 2009 based on a Randall Ray post. Um, all in all, Edward Harrison is not for the um, unemployment insurance of for the 21st century. Not against it completely but certainly not for it. So let's read a few of his thoughts. 
This is from the body of the article. I was having this conversation with Scott Fulweiler and Randy Ray, their two MMT types. Yes, they both indicated they were concerned about cronyism and the predator state. So you are right that this is something that concerns them. Perhaps I shouldn't say I am more negative than they are on that level. Perhaps I should say that they are more convinced that full employment is the primary goal of government. And this is what we get from the progenitors, is that the right idea? The developers of the first ideas of MMT, as I said yesterday, they looked into government accounts to see if a full employment program would be possible. And it's there that they found that, yes, um, modern governmental accounting is not restricted in any way in monetary sovereign nations and a full uh, jobs guarantee program would be possible. So those initial people are um, more convinced than Edward that full employment is the primary goal of government above everything else just get all the people employed where I think Scott, Randy and I agreed as to the cronyism and resource misallocation is less important than the output gap from underemployment in a massive recession like the one we have had. Um, output gap is the potential that the, that the country can do. Uh, the, the factories that are idling or idle, that is potential um, output gap and that can be um, that's the gap, <laughs> that's the output gap where um, a factory or any sort of business is not being used to its full potential. A uh, massive recession th th we've had and are still having because the unemployment and output gap is still large. Dun 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 dun. Uh, underemployment and massive recession like the one we had, if you had to err on any side, it would be on the side of increasing demand in orders to close the output gap, even if that meant some level of government waste and cronyism and resource misallocation. The alternative is to allow labour to sit idle and thus miss out on tens of billions of potential production. So they recognise the cronyism and um, resource misallocation probability, but think, well, look, if it comes to it, which are you going to err on the side of? And they say, well, if, if you've got to, if you've got this crony capitalism and this likelihood for misallocation, you've just got to wear it to a certain extent to get these people employed but know that you've got that problem and work on that uh, misallocation and cronyism uh, problem at the same time. But don't just have people sitting at home. One more thing about cronyism that has to do with the present political debates. I think this goes to my point more and is something I have discussed quite often with Marshall Urbach. The Obama administration is seen as having used Keynesian stimulus as a primary tool in dealing with this crisis. In my opinion, it is relatively certain that the economy would be in worse shape if they had not done so. The same goes for the liquidity provided in QE1. What he's saying there, it's not brilliantly written, or I'm just taking it from a, a longer article so it's hard to understand. Cronyism and misallocation give those projects overall title a bad rap as in the Keynesian stimulus because we know it went to um, pork barrel projects and lots of things that were rubbish. The whole idea of a Keynesian stimulus has got now got a bad name. That's the idea that he's talking about. And QE1, which most people would agree was a good idea from the Fed, because it is seen to have gone to too big to fail banks, that QE, QE has now got a bad rap, even though it's a good thing to do at the right time, the right place. So cronyism and misallocation taints these things, 
And if a job guarantee system was put in place and cronyism and misallocation went with it, again, that then would get tainted and re basically you lose um, the ability to use projects like this in the eyes of the people because they see them as tainted by cronyism and misallocation. So it's very, very difficult for to know what to do, basically, when you've got cronyism and potential probable misallocation almost guaranteed written into the way the United States is working at the moment. Right. This is from the bottom of the post. So while MMTers are hugely doubtful of the private sector's ability to generate full employment alone, they will have to make do with the private sector's lead while the government is in the thrall of corporatism, if only for political reasons. What he's saying is, what? Well, look, this job guarantee thing isn't going to fly anyway. It's just not the American way. The American way is the private way, although I think most people can agree that it's hugely doubtful if the private sector has the ability to generate full employment alone from here. And full employment's three or four percent, um, probably something around there due to the general churn. It's just not going to happen though without government help from this position. Now the I won't go into the big arguments of uh, get the government out of the way and the private sector would really wang it and give it large. Um, you, all you've got to say is maybe, but if that goes wrong you could be in a real pretty pickle. And I've picked this paragraph from earlier in the post but I've left it to put in last. My view, Edward's view, a job guarantee will never happen in the United States unless we have a deep recession, depression, like the one that began in 1929. Politically, this idea is a non-starter on this side of the Atlantic unless things get really bad and all other options have failed. I think we can all agree there. I say this because I'm a pragmatist and that's the political reality I am seeing. To my mind, the politics must always be front and centre because it's the politicians that really have the power. Now, if you wanted to look for a place where this job guarantee idea would first be implemented, try Spain, where youth unemployment is almost 50%. And that's a good thing to say, but Spain is just going into a round of tax rises and austerity, less spending, with youth employment, youth unemployment near 50%. Right. Finishing off with Roger Mitchell again, he of sovereign... I always get it wrong. Anyway, you, you must know it now. And we, I'll read the whole thing for you. The headline for his Sunday, January the 1st article is Why Modern Monetary Theories, Employer of Last Re Resort is a Bad Idea. Now, Roger Mitchell is calling the job guarantee program the employer of last resort. And he says, he says it's a bad idea as well. So we've had Cullen Roche, uh, Edward Harrison, and now Roger Michel Mitchell saying that the job guarantee employer of last resort by the government is a bad idea. I'll read you Mitchell's laws because he has this at the top of every post. Reduced money growth never stimulates economic growth. Reduced money growth never stimulates economic growth. And that's what Spain's going to find out. To survive long term a monetary Terrily, non-sovereign government must have positive balance of payments. That Spain must have a positive balance of payments, must export more than they import. Austerity equals poverty and leads to civil disorder. And we'll see that this year, 2012, uh, in Spain and many it, um, European countries. Those who do not understand the difference between monetary, monetary sovereignty and monetary non-sovereignty do not understand economics, write in Angela Merkel and people like that. Okay, into this article, as I frequently have mentioned, monetary sovereignty shares many fundamentals with modern monetary theory. 
There are differences, however, among which are the prevention and cure for inflation and one of the tenets of MMT called employer of last resort. And in the last three days, he's put his inflation post up, which I might um, highlight here tomorrow. I don't know. So we know the acronym so we can go on the bottom paragraph this post discusses ELR which is the job guarantee employer of last resort or job guarantee it's all the same MMT would like the federal government to become the employer of last resort there is a bit of history for this in the Great Depression's work works project administration the WPA we piss around which employed many people during the Depression. However, WPA was not an ELR in the way MMT suggests, which is to offer a job to anyone who wants one. And that's what the job guarantee would be. Anyone who wants one. He lists a load of problems, uh, and I'll just go with number eight, because it happens to be the last one, and gives us something. How does this affect private companies? And this is what he's saying. Um, how would the job guarantee affect the private companies that are trying to, out there trying to survive anyway? That provide the same products and or services being provided by the ELR, Employer of Last Resort Agencies. Providing money to the unemployed would stimulate the economy. But... I suggest the MMT device for providing money, i.e. providing a job, would create a giant bureaucracy filled with bully straw bosses plus jobs that provide neither satisfaction nor opportunity for meaningful growth and jobs that interfere with the job hunting process. It would doom us to a nation filled with non-productive equivalents of fast food servers and Walmart greeters. He highlighted this yellow, I didn't, that's why it's neat. Rather than attacking unemployment directly by offering government make-work jobs, I suggest the government stimulate the overall economy via increased federal deficits, enabling the private sector to offer more jobs. A stimulated private sector will provide more meaningful and economically beneficial jobs than will a government bureaucracy offering jobs to anyone who wants one. And then says, because you adherents of MMT have given much thought to the uh, ELR, I welcome your comments, etc. So you can see there's dispute out there, but there is still no dispute that if the government wants to, it can pump as much money into the economy as it seems fit to do. And obviously, knowing this, it would have to know what it was fit to do. A large discussion would have to go on about what was a fit amount of money to put into the economy. Not simple, but I, 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 I expressed it once. It's, it, it's, they've got a Ferrari and they're driving it like a Ford Escort. Because in the past all they had was a Ford Escort and they don't realise now they've got superpower there. But they just don't know how to use it. And the only way to know how to use it is to edge into it and get a lot of brain power in there and experience and try and use it to the best of its ability. At the moment, they are surely not. Bye.